Je vous souhaite la bienvenue au dernier volet du printemps de la série « L'enseignement 2 ». Cette série de conférences nous donne l'occasion d'explorer les nouvelles villes des territoires qui sont aussi nouvelles et connaître donc leurs réactions face aux nouvelles conditions architecturales et mutations urbaines liées à la transformation de l'économie mondiale. Cette présentation sera en anglais, mais on peut aussi avoir des questions après en français ou en anglais comme vous préférez. Welcome to the Learning From series. This year, our analysis has focused on London, Calgary, and tonight, the idea of the kibbutz in Israel. It is my great pleasure to introduce Yuval Yaski, who will speak this evening about Israel, or more specifically, the structure of the kibbutz, a place that is neither a city nor a village. In his presentation, Yuval will touch on themes he explored at last year's Venice Biennale, working with Galia Bar Or on the exhibition for the Israeli Pavilion entitled Kibbutz and Architecture Without Precedence. Tonight, Yuval will address the very particular character of Israel, where the idea of living and living together has been constructed historically under very peculiar and particular and very special conditions. The kibbutz is one of the constituing elements of Israel identity and landscape, a complex social, political, and spatial device. We're happy to include this presentation in the Learning From series, a series where we try to understand the urban condition, in this case, from a perspective perhaps outside of the city. And for example, another example outside of the city was the 2007 lecture on China and the rural conditions by Gregory Golden. The Learning From series takes its title from Learning From Las Vegas. Uh, Robert Venturi, Denise Scott Brown, and Stephen Isenor's vastly influential publication, which analyzed the commercial strips and architectural symbolism of Las Vegas in order to understand urban sprawl and a new kind of thinking about architecture that could be possible. In this spirit, this series brings together experts to explore specific conditions and their relevance to the future development of cities. Yval Yaski is the head of the architecture department at Bezalela Academy in Jerusalem and also an active architect, curator, and researcher based in Tel Aviv. Yaski's exhibition that I mentioned already uh, opened in 2010 at the Venice Biennale, but we're happy to also say that it'll be opening again next week at the GSD in Har at Harvard. As I mentioned, a question period will follow the presentation. Uh, please note that we will be taping this conference and any of the question period that may follow. And this will be part of our online archive, part of our web project, and will be consulted hopefully by many researchers in times to come. Uh, no pressure, Yuval. But, uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure again to introduce Yuval Yasky. I ask you to come up. Thank you. Hello, oh, good evening. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Meredith, for uh, the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here in Montreal. Um, in the following lecture, I will argue that the kibbutzim were a unique and original creation of 20th century modernism. Far from the usual perception as the Israeli village, a type of communal agrarian society of small homogeneous communities with a strong intimate social bonding between its members and a strong dogmatic ideological commitment to socialist idea. Contrary to this idea of the small utopian community, I would present today the idea of the big and growing kibbutz as the leading force in the development of, of the kibbutz as a settlement typology of unique character that evolved over a period of four decades and in many different ways acted as a model to Israeli state-initiated urban development. But first, before I dive into the particulars of the kibbutz, 
If you allow me, I would like to say a few words about the kibbutz in general, since I'm quite sure many of you have heard about it, being one of the strongest uh, brands coming out of Israel, but very few have a clear idea of what is the kibbutz. What was the context of its inception, its social structure, geographic distribution, and demographics? The last year, 2010, was the centennial year of the kibbutzim. Though the term kibbutz, which means in Hebrew gathering, was not used until the, the early 20s. In the teen years of the 20th century, the name of the first communal settlements was kvutza, which meant a group. This difference is not only semantic, but repre represents a critical shift in the development of collective ideas in the history of Zionist colonization of the land of Israel. The idea of the kvutzot, the groups, came about from groups of itinerary workers who traveled from one settlement to the other looking for work. Out of purely practical reasons, those groups of workers practice cooperation in different aspects of life, such as collective kitchens, sick funds, etc. The, the evolution of this practice was the idea of the kvutza as an autonomous settlement that practiced collectivity in all aspects of life, social and economic. These first groups were based on the idea of the small, exclusive and intimate group of no more than 35 to 40 members who live fully self-sufficient lifestyle. And it was not until 1921 that the first kibbutz was established out of the organization called the Labor Regiments, which was a collection of work groups organized around a collective financial structure, but dispersed throughout the country, with their headquarters based in the Israel Valley. The main difference in the idea of the kibbutz was that it rejected the close-off close exclusivity of the intimate group and embraced the idea of the kibbutz as a universal idea that is oriented towards the general society as an alternative to both the backwardness of the agrarian village and the capitalist exploitation of city life. The first ideologues of the kibbutz idea, th these are the, the groups, the early beginnings, the, the first ideologues of the kibbutz idea have aspired to establish a national network of kibbutzim linked to each other through the organization called the United Kibbutz Movement. The first kibbutz of this movement was Ein Charod, which was established by a group of uh, pioneers that split from uh, Tel Yosef, the, um, the labor regiments. <clears throat> from those early years on, the kibbutzim were organized in four national movements. Each had its own organization, its planning teams, its branches in the Jewish diaspora, and representative in the Zionist institutions. So the, the kibbutz, the kibbutz uh, is really one of the strongest uh, uh, names, brands that came out of Israel. I, I, I would let, just want to give you a few statistics so you understand the scale of this phenomena. Today, there still are 285 kibbutzim, but most of these kibbutzim were established in the first four decades between 1910 and 1950. I remind you, 1948 is the year of the establishment of the state of Israel. So most of the kibbutzim were actually uh, established before the establishment of the state of Israel. 100 until 1948 and then 58 more from 1948 to 1950. During the 1950s, many kibbutzim were established as consequence of the great split in the United Kibbutzim Movement, which until then was the largest movement. From the 50s on, the number of new kibbutzim decreased drastically for reasons that I will discuss later. At their highest point in 1947, that's before the, the State of Israel, the kibbutzim um, population was only 7% of the general Jewish population in Israel. So this whole phenomena at the highest before the establishment of the State of, of Israel was only 7%. Today, the kibbutzim population is only 1.2% of the general Jewish population in Israel. But the political power of kibbutzim until the 1970s far exceeded the proportion in the Israeli Jewish population. Just for example, in, in, during the 1960s, uh, when kibbutzim population was about 4% of the general population in Israel, of the Jewish general population, um, they had 15% of the Israeli Knesset. So the, the political power was, was immense. Even today, 
even though their political power is not that, that high, they still have members in their parliament far more than, uh, than the 1.2% that they um, occupied in the, in the general population. Kibbutzim today are responsible for 40% of the agricultural gross product of Israel and over 12% of the industrial product. So it's still a very, very strong and very big um, phenomenon. Now we cannot, we cannot start even touching the, the issue of the kibbutzim without understanding the social structure um, of the kibbutz. The basis for understanding the kibbutz is to understand that the kibbutzim were built under the principle of full partnership in property and the total elimination of private ownership. The collective community had full sovereignty over all aspects of life, from birth to burial. It's interesting to say that the only, um, the only sector in Israel that um, is responsible for its own burial ceremonies that are not religious is the kibbutzim. All the rest are under the law of Israel, has to go through the religious uh, ceremonies. Only the kibbutzim are exempt from it, for example. Um, <clears throat> the collective, uh -huh. the daily life of the kibbutz was governed by the General Assembly, a weekly gathering of the, of the all adults of the members of the kibbutz, where all the most important issues were decided upon, whether accepting new members, buying new machine for the factory, or approving an application of a member to go on vacation. As the kibbutzim grew bigger and more complex, the authority over the daily aspects of management ooh. Houston, we have a problem. I don't know what's going on. It worked perfectly fine, but it always does, right? But I'll, I'll, I think I'll go on and um, we'll try to resolve it. <clears throat> As the kibbutzim grew bigger and more complex, the authority over the daily aspects of management were transferred to different committees whose members served in rotation and the assembly was responsible for the more important decisions in the life of the community. Yeah, that's my <laughs> sorry. No images. Isn't yeah. that sad? We'll try something. Let's try this one. Doesn't have all the images. Yep. Well, this one is working. I hope it will. It doesn't. It's not the full version, but um, we'll manage. Um, <clears throat> so here are the committees. It has to be stated uh, at this point that the new collective community was perceived as a means to creating new social order, which was supposed to replace the bourgeois society. For that reason, one of the main issues central to the new collective was the creation of a new type of family life. In the early days, even the issue of marriage was under discussion and many members held the position that marriage as a social institution should have been eliminated altogether. So there were kind of hippies too. The actual consequences of such discussions led to the establishment of one of the kibbutzim's most familiar and controversial ideas, the children houses. or um, as they were known in the Shomer Atzair, Kibbutz Arzitz, another movement, they were known as the, the Children's Society. The children, the children were brought up from day one in nursery houses and later in the children houses with their friends of the same age. Actually, when someone, well, a kibbutz member saw this uh, um, 
photograph in, in, the, in the exhibition, he said that uh, it's a dangerous uh, photograph because it was him with a child and he was not allowed to be there. So uh, that he, he kind of stopped by on his uh, daily routine to see his, his uh, child and it, that was forbidden. Um, <clears throat> so their contact with their biological family was limited to a few hours in the afternoon. Here we see uh, children in a bomb, it's a bomb shelter uh, in the 60s in the Jordan Valley and as you see uh, during the war but they're still with their uh, caretaker and not with their, um, with their all together, not with their families. And this is the kind of the late the night that the parents uh, take their children to the to the sleeping quarters and um, put them to sleep. The afternoon family reunion was just one of a series of repeating rituals around which the life of the members were organized. These rituals were diagrammatically speaking organized around different spheres that had a great impact on the physical structure of the kibbutzim. There were the, pro the production, the consumption, and the social spheres. The value of labor was most definitely one of the most significant issues of the kibbutz. And I quote, work is both philosophy and a principle in the kibbutz. Not the least important aim of Zionism has been to turn the intellectual city-bred Jewish immigrant occupied in a marginal vocation into a productive worker who will derive satisfaction from the creative work. And this text is from 1979, not from the 30s or 40s. Um, all the kibbutzim had a production, on, production zone, a farm, a f factories, agricultural fields, etc., that was sustained by the members themselves. The division of labor was based on the needs of the kibbutz, and the different branches, as it was called, were decided by the personal, personnel committee or coordinator. What we see here is the, what we call Sidu Abuda, the organization of labor. Um, you see this uh, board over here, um, and all the members are, every, every day the, the committee would uh, determine where you go to, um, where you work. That's a discussion between, I guess, uh, they're, they're fighting over something. Um, <clears throat> the consumption sphere's main arena was the dining hall, the locus of social interaction over three meals a day, other consumption areas were the clothing, the clothing storage, and the laundry, and the grocery shop. These are the dining halls, and they're preparing for a new meal. This, is, this improvisation of um, this cleaning thing, I don't know, sponge thing. And this is the clothing uh, storage. Uh, maybe you might know, but um, no one had his own clothes. It was all from, uh, from this storage, and even if kids would get a uh, present from from the granddaddies and in the, in the city, they would have to give it away and they, they would use it on, on festivals, etc. but others that need it would, would, uh, would use it, the other kids. So that's another part of, uh, of the consumption uh, and, and social structure of the kibbutz. <clears throat> the social sphere was most active after returning from the children's houses. It focused around the political life of the kibbutz, namely, namely the committees, the member club that was usually served as a reading room, a music hall, and a debate club. And the culture hall, which in many kibbutzim hosted music concerts, theater performances, and movie screenings. And of course, there was the weekly assembly, which usually took place in the dining hall. So here we can see the, this is the reading room during the 1930s or 40s. A debate in the, in the members club. Um, a music concert in the dining hall. And this is a member sitting outside of the club and watching TV. Of course, TV sets, private TV sets were not allowed um, all the way until the late 70s. And that's another photograph of the, of the assembly. The physical structure. Now we go to the architecture. The, phys the physical structure of the kibbutzim evolved over a period of 40 years starting from the early years of the small intimate group and reaching the, its evolutionary climax in the early 50s. In the first 15 years of the Kfutzot and later the Kibbutzim were organized around the imported model of the German or Central European farmyard. 
It is interesting to mention here that the, farm, the term farmyard is still used in most kibbutzim to describe their production area. In the early farmyard model, all three spheres I mentioned earlier overlapped in one single space. The livestock, the dining hall, the small industry, and the residential areas were organized ar around one large yard. What we can see here, this is kibbutz ganch well. This is the, these are the living quarters, and these are, these are the cow sheds. So it, it literally overlapped. As the social life of the young members developed and children were born, the farm world was separated from the social yard and a more complex special organization emerged. And we have two, um, two examples. This is a Merchavia in the Israel Valley. And we see the one yard, it has everything. These are the, the, the cow sheds. Um, this is the social area. And this is the production area. This is a Degania. We have, this is the social area over here. And that's, sorry. And th this is the farm and this is the social area here. And that's the, this is Tel Yosef, um, this is the most complex of the, of the yard um, model that we can see. This is the, the, the farm, that's a production area, and then this is the social area. It's all, already completely separated. <clears throat> the evolution of the kibbutz as a hybrid urban form must be seen within the context of the struggle between two con contrasting vectors in the history of political Zionism. On the one hand, the urban vision represented by Theodor Herzl, the Jewish cosmopolitan Viennese writer who in 1902 published his utopian model Alt Neuland, Old New Land, in which he describes the Jewish state in Palestine as a thriving liberal urban society. And I quote, whoever would attempt to convert the Jew into a husbandsman would be making an extraordinary mistake for a peasant is in fact a historical category. The peasant is consequently a type which is in course of extinction. Whenever he is artificially preserved, it is done on account of the political in interests which he is intended to serve. Are we, therefore, to credit Jews who are intelligent with a desire to become peasants of the old type? On the other hand, the rural vision of David Ben-Gurion, the leader of the Zionist organizations, in the land of Israel, who described with his sharp colonizing logic the struggle for the conquest of the land just one year before the outburst of the great Arab rebellion in 1936. Once again, we came to construct an urban state and are becoming, here too, an urban people. Whilst around us is a people closely connected with the land, not only here in this country, but in all the neighboring countries as well. We have the capacity to establish a large urban state in Tel Aviv and Haifa with a million inhabitants or more, but it, its end will be like that of Carthage. Read about the internal situation in Hannibal's time, and you will find a portrait of Tel Aviv, the same dissociated culture, the same rootlessness, the same dependence on a foreign, hostile rural environment, the same imagined individuality. Shall we await the same end as well? Within these two poles, I would like to locate the kibbutzim and make the argument that the two seemingly opposing forces were in play in a permanent tension that for many years were the most productive and innovative force in the creation of a settlement pattern in Israel. We know that the pioneers of Enchaod and other such collective groups were well acquainted with the writings of Marx, Engels, and maybe most important, the Russian anarchist Pyotr Kropotkin whose writing was very influential in the intellectual circle of those promoting the idea of the kibbutz as a city-village model. In 1924, the pioneers of Encharod wrote a detailed manifesto outlining their aspirations. This document was sent to the Zionist agency, the central body responsible for the Jewish colonization of Israel, who was hostile to the whole collective tendencies of the settlers and considered it adolescent anarchic ideas of a bunch of youngsters who would change their attitude as they grow up. And I quote the manifesto. Our goal in our settlement is to live the life of a large society, a working society, 
which overcomes the artificial differentiation harmful in both a its human and its national economic aspects between work in pure agriculture and work in, artis in artisanry and industry, keeping urban work and rural work separate. Our aspiration is a society that unites physical and mental work within itself. Our aspiration <clears throat> also entails our wish to create a cultural center in this element that will provide for its cultural needs and in which the means dedicated to culture, adult education, and the education of children will be concentrated. This is an interesting event, 1926. You see the, the pioneers in uh, the Israel Valley, all hard workers, and um, they sit in the quarry in Enchaot, 1926, and listen to Yasha Heifetz, the violinist, as he plays. Um, and this is, it represents this quest for, uh, for culture, for spiritual life, and the life of, uh, of, um, of a, a, a working productive life, um, which is very, a very unique, I think, um, idea. This emergence of the big and growing kibbutz in the early 1920s have demanded a new type of settlement plan. It was the well-known German Jewish architect, Richard Kaufmann, the chief architect of the Jewish agency, who was the first to acknowledge the urban implications of such a collective lifestyle. In his 1926 plan for the Encharod Tel Yosef, we see it here. This is Tel Yosef, and this is Encharod. Both uh, exist, there's another Encharod here today. Um, and that's, that's uh, the, the basic plan, which, which is still very visible today. <clears throat> we can already see the features that will become characteristics of the kibbutz, mainly the separation of space into discrete, di discrete elements, the hierarchy of the plant towards the center. You see that this is the center of uh, Tel Yosef, center of Encharod, and the, the way it's organized. It is interesting to know two aspects that are still evident in this plan, which will later disappear. One is the strong actuality of the plan, reminder of Kaufman's formal German origins and his affiliation to the Garden City movement. The second is much more important. In this plan from 1925-26, we can still see traces of parcellation of the land, which was eliminated altogether from the kibbutzim soon after this plan was drawn. So, we, sorry. We can still, we can still see the, the lots here, drawn. So it's, it's divided, but um, there's still a trace of private property here. The reason for these traces of private property was the general belief among the Zionist leader that the kibbutz is nothing but an adolescent idea that will disappear within a few years. This, this struggle between the kibbutzim and the Zionist institution was not resolved even after three decades of their existence. In 1941, Arthur Rupin, one of the prominent figures in the Zionist establishment wrote, what determines the type of settlement are the personal spiritual character of the settlers, which dictates their affinity to be attracted to collective life or individual life. Young settlers, 20 to 25 years of, old, of age, prefer usually kibbutz life since they do not feel mature enough to manage their own farm. But settlers who have reached their late 20s or 30s prefer individual farms since they already trust their ability to manage it, and since most of them are already married with children and feel a stronger need for privacy. So was, there, there was a, a real belief that uh, as the, the pioneers get older and establish their own families, the whole thing with the kibbutzim will just vanish and they will become uh, villages of, uh, of other types. In 1943, the kibbutzim who have acquired considerable political power cut themselves loose from the grip of the planning department of the Zionist agency, and each movement opens its own planning bureau. The chief art architects of these new bureaus were, on the one hand, Shmulik Mistechkin, a Bauhaus uh, graduate for the Kibbutz Artsi, the Shomer Atzair, and Shmuel Bikos in the United Kibbutzim. Both of them became the most prominent figures in the crystallization of the Kibbutz typology in the 40s and on until the 1960s. <clears throat> this is, for example, this is a, a sketch 
for Ashdot Yaakov, a kibbutz of 3,000 members, um, drawn by uh, vehicles. And we can see how urban it is, that it, it doesn't look like a village whatsoever. Undoubtedly, the lack of parcellation and the undivided space are the most identifiable character of the kibbutzim and the most important physical aspect that makes it such a unique typology. The lack of private property have led to the evolution of a settlement in which the space is continuous and fluid, where no division of the land exists, and at the same time where everything is meticulously calculated according to the best planning practices of its time. We can see these are general plans. This is general planting plan for Kibbutz Genosa. We can see it's still very formal, orthogonal plan, um, uh, garden city model, but we see how, how well organized it is. <clears throat> when we look at the zoning maps of the Kibbutzim, what we see is a stain of one color, yellow, residential area, within which the community is the sole sovereign. It may seem as if the planning and execution of the kibbutzim was an organic bottom-up development, as in many agrarian societies. But this is not the case. The kibbutzim are a strange hybrid between top-down modernist planning and an extremely strong communal participation. The result is a series of over 250 repetitions of the same type, acting on, under the same principle, but with not one particular kibbutz identi identical to any other, due to the differences in local traditions, ambitions, and needs. And, and this, is, this is a zoning map for a, a pretty late zoning map from the 1980s, but we can still see that most of it is unparcelled. Um, the, the, all the, this is what we call the, the camp. The camp is the, the yellow stain. Uh, it's a big kibbutz of more than, uh, more than a thousand members, and still we, we see no roads, we see no, no uh, differentiation. And and this is the, the plan of the same kibbutz from the 40s, and we see how, how planned it is. Every, every, every building, every uh, boulevard, everything is, is totally planned and, and thought after. <clears throat> what were then the principles and that characterize the kibbutzim and makes them so easily identifiable even today after so many years? Uh, this, this Photograph here is, is beautiful. This is uh, the, the toolkit for uh, Bickles. He, he, he would travel to Kibbutzim. Bickles was the chief architect, as I mentioned, of the Kibbutz Amuha, the United Kibbutzim. And he would, he would travel to Kibbutzim with his box and his tools and would uh, deal with the, with the community with this uh, small scale model of a Kibbutz. And together they will decide uh, on how, where to put the residential areas. And we can see here. That's a theater. These are the children houses, all different typologies, and they would just uh, play around with it until they get to the to the right positioning. And it was all with um, with the social participation. As I've just mentioned, the main character is the lack of territorial division. The kibbutz is a unified domestic space, distributed throughout a large area and connected via an intricate network of footpaths and let and landscape open open public areas. This is, a, this is a very simple diagram. This is, this is the single family house or the, yeah, the house of the, you know, in, in other villages. And what happens in the kibbutz that it becomes very, very uh, minimal and the, all the domestic um, functions are distributed within the space. So basically, and it's still very, very strong today, the feeling is that the kibbutz is the house and the members live in rooms, and this is how it, it is called until today, um, the room. The residential cells of the kibbutz members were as minimal as nine by 12 feet. This is what we see here. At the beginning, there had been no toilet or bathrooms in these minimal cells, and these were added only during the 1930s. The official name of those cells was rooms, and it implemented implied to the idea that the kibbutz as a whole was considered the house. So we can see here that's a two-story high um, residential building. That's the panel of the second story. And this is an apartment. It's, it's uh, around 12 feet uh, by maybe 16 here, something like that. That's another um, 
it's a little later, so we can see that there is a, there is a toilet here. But if you, if you look closely, this is, this is the room. The toilet opens to the, to the corridor. The corridor is public. So basically what happens is that everyone can use the toilet. It's not private. It's not part of, of the... It's kind of a weird hybrid, again, it, that every room has one, but it opens to the outside, not to the inside. <coughs> The rest of the domestic functions were distributed in the residential territory, the yellow stain in the zoning maps. The main room of this extended house with the dining hall in close proximity within the center of the residential camp, the other social functions were located such, such as the culture house, the members club, and usually just behind the social area. There was the consumption zone separating the residential area from the production zone. So these are, this, this, is a, this is a room in you know, Kibbutz Givat Brenner, room in Ena Shufet, uh, another kibbutz. This is a residential structure in Ein Shemer, the first one to be built. Here we can see a, a, a more general view of uh, the kibbutz. We can see a lot, of, a lot of tents. That was the beginning. And these are the two-story high uh, residential buildings in the big kibbutzim. This is... This is the old farm. This, I showed you that this is the cow sheds with a, with a residential barracks uh, on top of them. But that's a later uh, photograph. So we can see the tents. We can see these modernist white buildings and then all these Haymat rural uh, residential buildings. It's all condensed in, into this one space. <clears throat> These are the, um, the bathrooms, the collective bathrooms, sanitarium, culture house, another uh, comp culture com complex. We can see this. This is a very typical plan. Uh, we can see uh, uh, the uh, club, me the members club, a library, um, uh, music, uh, music hall, and it's all um, connected with, the, with, it, with these arcades. That's, that's another example of such an uh, identical uh, idea in another kibbutz. And this, we can see all, all the elements, but they would condense in one structure. We can see this uh, piano. Every kibbutz had a piano. This is the library, and this is the reading room. The library always separates the, the music from the reading room because of uh, acoustic um, uh, problems. <clears throat> the special con configuration made the landscape the most important and maintained aspect of the kibbutz. Since the internal landscape was considered an inseparable, inseparable part of the domestic sphere. It is interesting to note that it wasn't like that from the, from the beginning. The landscape as a planning issue came about from two different levels. On the one hand, it started emerging as a local initiative to improve the quality of life in the kibbutzim, what was called camp, camp melioration, so this is a very beginning of a kibbutz. There is no landscape. There is nothing, just a camp. Then the second stage is that people would start gardening the, the front of their, of their um, living barracks and until, until that. Only later, through the involvement of a few highly educated landscape and gardener architects, have the issue of the landscaping become so crucial to the kibbutz. This early group was mainly composed of, from graduates of German gardening school, there was actually one particular gardening school in Germany for Jewish gardeners um, in Alem. And most of, the, most of the kibbutzim, the gardeners and landscape uh, architects in the kibbutzim, they are, the first generation came from this particular school. <clears throat> and their formal Central European education is evident in their work, just like it was apparent in Richard Kaufmann, Kaufmann's work, and they came from Germany, all of them. Um, we can see, I don't know how well you see it, it's very old. Uh, this is uh, the rose garden in, uh, in Harod. We see how formal it is. The ac we see the main axis, it's symmetrical. It's um, very different than what we see today in Kibbutzim. That's another one by an architect called Kutner. He's a uh, Swiss born. And remember the name because you'll see how he evolves. But this is very formal. You can see this is the, the um, dining hall, the these are the children houses. There's a, um, this is the central area of the kibbutz. And, and the garden is very, very kind of bizarre aesthetics. 
Until the late 1940s, we can, we can see a strong tendency towards orthogonal grid patterns with the main axis accentuated as boulevards of trees. The in-between open areas, especially around the central structure, usually called the Great Lawn, were designed as formal gardens in a very traditional way. In the, in the late 1940s, with the emergence of new actors, most of them graduates of local schools, local Israeli schools, we can identify a new, a new style, less formal and more fluid. Some researchers call this shift towards the less formal, softer landscaping, a shift from the formal garden to the landscape garden, or maybe from a French style to an English garden style. I would like to argue that this shift has more to do with a new sensitivity towards the local Israeli conditions which the new generation used so well as they were either born in Israel or immigrated as young kids. In addition to this new sensitivity, this new approach is connected to a new commitment to, of this generation that was apparent in the Israeli architecture of, this, of the time. There was a strong rejection, rejection of any stylistic formalism and a strong belief in the value of sincerity through the use of the barest elements possible. The garden city formalism of the European educated generation that was borrowed from the old world did not fit the fluid character of the kibbutz, where there were no element of front and back, which the, these old boulevards of the old style was trying to emphasize or create. The buildings were situated in the landscape as freestanding forms like garden folies, and in that case, the landscape garden approach was a much better fit than the garden city attempts of the old generation. And here we can see a very typical um, situation. This is the, the back of one row and this is the front of the other and the, the, the situation of, of streets that um, uh, of front and rear is just it's, it's totally blurred in the kibbutz. The new configurations were much more sculptural. They manipulated topography with very sub subtle move that recreated the landscape and made the integration between the outdoor areas and the built structures seem more organic. This soft landscape urbanism, if I can borrow the, the term, is now the main visual element that creates the physical identity of the kibbutzim. It is very easily mistaken to be natural and many people are surprised to hear that it is all artificial and man-made. Or as a member of Gan Shmuel called it in an interview with the French director Claude Lanzmann, Nature Artificielle. That, that was my uh, French for tonight. <clears throat> in both cases, that of the formal garden city and the landscape urbanism, the built structures were considered set secondary apart from the main cultural institutions. In terms of the architectural style, the kibbutz demonstrates again um, this is, this is the, a very late uh, um, garden by this uh, Swiss-born Kutner, and we can see how, how different it is from, this is from 1951, the other one was 1946, 7, so in a, in a, in a four or five years, it, it changed dramatically. <clears throat> in terms of the architectural style, the kibbutz demonstrates, again, its hybrid character. On the one hand, many residential structures are mediocre examples of Heimat architecture. But on the other hand, as early as the late 20s, we can see beautiful examples of modernist structures and interesting, and interesting attempts to do with the climatic issues in the hot, arid climate of the Jordan Valley. We can see these large roofs. We can see this, this is a, um, a totally modern... Uh, we can think it was um, maybe um, um, the Netherlands or something like that. The public structures were designed more carefully. From the beginning, we can see attempts to develop a civic identity to, to the dining halls, the clubs, and the culture houses. Apart from their architectural style, the public structures in the kibbutzim, even if they obeyed existing typological rules, were always original since their functions were unique to their social context. The dining hall, for example, was never just a place for eating, like a campus mensa or a company dining facility. It had to serve three meals a day, accommodate weekly assemblies, host local festivals, and much more. For that reason, it evolved over time to become a museum universal space, highly flexible and interchangeable. 
we can see uh, that's a um, 1961 um, dining hall by uh, Munio Gitai, another Bauhaus graduate, and we can see the, 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 this hall, this is the main dining hall, but we, we can see how it, how it evolves with all these different uh, subspaces um, that makes it much more uh, flexible. <clears throat> the culture house was usually used as a, as a theater, a music hall, but in many kibbutzim it was meant to accommodate the Passover meal, and for that reason, the steps were much deeper than necessary so it, it can accommodate the Passover tables and crowds. In most culture ho houses, we identified another feature that we usually do not see in other places. The stage can open in two sides for indoor and outdoor performances. It usually faces a big lawn, and so in the hot summer nights, the members sit outside and watch the show. So, just show you a few. This is the dining hall in uh, um, Tel Yosef from the 1930s. 1960s, Robert Barnett in Givat Brenner. Miss Tetchkin, another graduate of the Bauhaus, uh, 1967 8 um, in Merchavia. This is the culture house in Hefziba uh, by a woman architect named Ziva Armon. And the, this is the, the stage is right here and, and it opens. You can hardly see it, I'm sorry, but uh, it opens to the lawn right here. This is Bikel's in Neve Itan, the culture house. And this is the way it opens. So there are, there are these folding doors and it opens to the outside. This is the way they, um, this is the culture house and you can see the steps, they're very deep. So this is the, pass it's organized for Passover meal for, for all the members, hundreds of members, and it's all in the culture house. This is the Museum of Art, for example, in, in, um, in En Chaud. It's a wonderful, wonderful structure. One of the first museums in, in, the, whole, in the world to use indirect natural light. The story is that Renzo Piano, when he uh, designed the, his Houston Museum, he, he studied the section of this building. Education and children-related architecture is an issue that deserves a lecture of its own, but I will only say a few words. The first thing to say is that in many kibbutzim, the first permanent structure, usually built as a safe house, was the children's housing. And this is what we can see here. This is the first permanent uh, building in En Charod. Uh, again, a very uh, international style, white modernist architecture, and it was the children's houses. The issue of the children and their place within the kibbutz was central to the two large movements. In the kibbutz Artsi, the Shomer Atzair, the children's area was separated from the kibbutz itself and was configured as a mic microcosm of the kibbutz with all its components and was called the Children's Society. This is one, one such uh, children's society in Kibbutz Bet Alpha in the Israel Valley. And we can see it's, uh, it's basically uh, contained. It has clear boundaries. It's out, outside of the kibbutz. And we have all the different uh, rooms for the, for the children and, um, and all the other facilities and sports. And there's a, a small farm. It was all just organized, totally organized like a, like a kibbutz but outside of the, of the adult society. We can see here, that's a diagram uh, during the, the um, planning of, of, of the children's society. Uh, uh, the question of the dining hall, whether each class needs to have its own dining hall or every cluster of four classes would have its dining hall, or like the kibbutz itself, there is a one central dining hall for the whole society. These are all questions that has been asked and diagrammed, etc. <coughs> <clears throat> in, the, in the United Kibbutz movement, the children's houses were integrated into the kibbutz fi fabric, clo to, close to the center, each group in its own children's house that contained everything for the children, sleeping room, dining room, bath bathrooms, and classrooms. This configuration was called integrative class. It's interesting to say that while in all the functions in the kibbutz were room, it was the dining room and the, and and the, the only place that they used the, main, the, the word house was for the children, it was the children houses. So, uh, the, so it, it, and, and we can see here, this is, these are the, we can see here, these are, these are, these are the children houses and they're in scale and, and, and configuration, it's all different. This is the, the dining room, it's a kibbutz shfaim. 
Um, and we see how close it is to the center. It's not separated at all. It's the other way around. This is the integrative class. We can see here uh, an example. This is, um, this is the classroom. These are the children uh, quarters and the bathrooms, etc. And this is the dining hall. This is a project by Arya Sharon in uh, Sdeli, our uh, religious kibbutz. All the kibbutzim, big or small, were planned in, in minute details. At first, there were, as already mentioned, distinct differences between the different movement, m movements. But as the time passed, those got almost unidentified. As the kibbutzim grew bigger and bigger, the largest kibbutzim housed around 2,000 members and residents, there arose problems concerning the functionality of the kibbutz center area. The simplest solution to those problems was densification of the residential neighborhoods. In many kibbutzim, we can find multi-family housing types that preceded the post-war housing projects. Later on, especially during the 1960s, we can find other solutions such as low-rise, high-density carpets. Um, we can, that's a diagram of the interrelatedness of different functions in the kibbutzim, uh, a diagram of, of radiuses and, and the, the issue of, of density and, and uh, uh, the, the fact that everything had to to relate to the center, to the social center, was crucial to the, to the kibbutz. We can see the, the density, this is En Chaot, these are the two first uh, children houses, Kibbutz Yagu, another pretty big kibbutz near Haifa, and we can see the, we can see the, the urban character of it. This is a, a carpet, a low-rise, high-density uh, neighborhood in a very large kibbutz, Givat Brenner. And, and we can see, we can see the, the, the um, amount of, of thinking that was invested in it. And this is, uh, this is the local contribution. Uh, this is Moshe Safdi. Um, I, I assume you all know him. Uh, he did two wonderful, wonderful residential uh, neighborhoods in the late 70s and early 80s in the kibbutzim. And we can see the configuration. You can see how dense it is. Um, um, and, but, but these are later ones, the carpet uh, configurations. <clears throat> Regional scale was another consideration of the kibbutz movement and their planning bureaus. In order to streamline the distribution networks and create regional support systems, many kibbutzim, especially in the remote interlands and in border area, were established in groups of different configurations. These groupings crystallized into what can be defined as urban agricultural conglomerates with polycentric character, but with different degrees of regional cooperation, such as mutual theaters, industrial areas, and other such functions. And I won't, I won't uh, dwell on this too much. <clears throat> the rise of, Isra of Israeli urbanism and the fall of the kibbutz. As I already mentioned before, sorry. <clears throat> Although the first foundational text of Herzlian political Zionism described a real liberal urban civilization, the actual forces that shaped the image of the new Jewish civilization were definitely anti-urban. It is not by chance that the, the only Zionist city that was established by, by the Zionist institutions was Afula in the Israel Valley in 1925 by Richard Kaufman. The other urban Jewish settlements were built either by private developers or as suburban neighborhoods of existing cities. For example, Tel Aviv was a suburb of Yafo at the, as, at, at the early beginnings. And this is, this is Afula. That basically, the, this is the only Zionist um, city um, before the um, establishment of the State of Israel. It was not until the establishment of the independent State of Israel and the Israel Physical Plan of 1951-52, done by a large team led by architect Arya Sharon, a Bauhaus graduate, and a former member of Kibbutz Gan Shmuel, that the state initiated and built a network of small and medium-sized cities all over the country. Arya Sharon's work was undoubtedly influenced by the kibbutzim. He himself was involved in the general planning and the architecture of many of them. When we look at the designs of the different new towns proposal in Sharon's plan, it is evident that the neighborhood units were modeled after the generously distributed housing units sitting on green surfaces. These new towns were built in order to absorb the immigration waves of the early years and were considered as social and national condensers. 
much as the kibbutz was in the pre-World War II years. The hope of repeating the success of the kibbutzim on a much greater scale failed, but the reasons for that I shall not discuss um, tonight. So we can, we can see this, 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 these are images from uh, Arya Sharon's plan. And this is Richard Kaufman, a kibbutz uh, from 1948, one of the late kibbutzim that he did. This is the center of uh, the new city of Ramla. And this is uh, B Shmuel Bikos, uh, 1946 uh, center for kibbutz in the Negev. New town. Ashdot Yaakov, a kibbutz. Another housing um, project. And this is a kibbutz, Kibbutz Yagur. This is the kibbutz. <clears throat> At the same time that the official policy of the state mechanism shifted from the kibbutz and the rural sector towards a massive new project of immigration absorption, the kibbutzim were caught up in an internal struggle that ended with the split of the United Kibbutz Movement. From 1948 until 1950, 58 new kibbutzim were established in order to strengthen and fortify the borders of the nascent state, but also as a geopolitical means of appropriating the deserted Palestinian property and settlements left behind. Between 1950 and 1977, most of the kibbutzim were established as paramilitary outposts that were later civilized by graduates of different Zionist youth movements linked to the kibbutz movement and organized in groups called nuclei, Garinim. Starting with a political shift in 1977 and accelerated by dramatic credit crisis during the 1980s, the kibbutzim have gone through a painful process of change and privatization. Within these processes, the old model of the undivided continuous surface of the old kibbutz, with its footpaths linked to the social and functional center, was replaced by an American suburban model. In the last decade from 1995 to recent years, it seems as if the kibbutzim are a matter of the past and their only possible future is a segregated suburban model. But in the last couple of years, the possibility of the kibbutz to reinvigorate itself as an intelligent, sustainable alternative to the Levitan model has been discussed in intensively. <clears throat> It first appeared between the four walls of the academic institutions, but today it is accelerating and gathering popular support from within the communities who demand alternative solutions that fit better to the existing fabric. Until now, none of the pro proposed alternatives that have started to emerge was actually built, but hopefully it won't take long before it will. Now, I, I have a few alternatives in the other um, uh, document that doesn't work, um, and I would just, if I, I just want to show two short um, films taken very recently for the Venice Biennale. This is Givat Brenner, it used to be the largest kibbutz in Israel for many, many years. You can see how urban it is. It's take, taken um, this year, a few months ago.
is the, <coughs> the culture house and the dining room, dining hall. which is still active, as you can see. Yad Khanar was the only communist um, kibbutz in Israel. You now you see what happens. Uh, the only communist, the only real communist uh, kibbutz in Israel, built by Hungarian immigrants and associated with a uh, communist party. Is lived in. You see the social realism of the dining hall, which is deserted. Chateau Kibbutz. Um, and that's it. That's, this is the this is uh, the present, <clears throat> and there is uh, some kind of change today. That um, part of it, um, but it's interesting to know that most of the kibbutzim, the members of kibbutzim, don't know anything about their history, uh, how radical, um, and what, and and the quality of the of the these spaces that they they occupy today. And, and I hope that uh, by this kind of lectures and exhibitions, we can make some change um, because the Levittown model is definitely not the right destiny for these spaces. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for presenting this fascinating research. We have time for some questions. Um, thank you for the presentation. 
But I must say I'm a little puzzled. Uh, maybe it's a question of time. You seem to be suggesting that the kibbutz uh, movement still has positive things to offer us because of the hybrid nature of the system and how it evolved, despite the fact that it failed as a movement. So it seems to me there's a little bit of contradiction here. Uh, maybe you could explain it. In other words, if it's still useful as an alternative, why did it fail? Well, you know, I guess failure is in the eye of the beholder. Because I don't, I don't think that a movement uh, so radical and uh, with such utopian um, backbone that existed for 100 years is such a big failure. Um, I think there are many, many misdoing. Uh, the, the, the main, the central one is the, the alignment um, in, in later years with the, with the geopolitical um, ideas uh, of the government. But um, I'm, I'm not talking about the movement whatsoever. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a movement thing for me. I think that during the, these years, this model evolved into a very um, interesting model of human settlement and the ideas um, that materialized in, in these uh, settlements can be still used um, even as uh, circumstances have changed. So all, the, uh, all these new neighborhoods that are attached to the kibbutzim um, can, can learn much more from the intelligence uh, of, of, the, of the kibbutz model, not, not, as, a, not as a collective, based, not, not necessarily as a collective thing, but, uh, but as a special model that uh, evolved. And uh, I, ca I can go deeper into the, the, the new capitalist model that are being uh, developed today in kibbutzim because they are not, um, not totally Thatcherist, uh, purely capitalist ideas. The ideas about mutual aid and uh, welfare, uh, welfare community that are still uh, active in kibbutzim, even those who, went private, who are privatizing are still privatizing into a, a softer model of capitalism and not like the, for, for example, the communist uh, states that uh, this kind of uh, oligar oligarchy developed and they took all the resources and that's it. And so, so it's, it's, a, it's a still a very complex and, and still evolving situation that I think there is a lot to learn from. I, I found, uh, thank you very much. I, I found that the, you know, the early description of the kibbutz and, and some the images of it, the early, uh, it's very regulated uh, housing and plan, is very much like um, Mennonite communities. Like? Mennonite. Mennonite communities mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. Mennonites were from Germany, and they they have strict. Uh, there's a women's house, and there's a men's house, and they eat separately, and they wear the same sort of clothing. Everybody wears the same sort of clothing, and it's an agrarian community. And uh, you certainly see those in uh, Pennsylvania, and because they also have. In Pennsylvania, they, they uh, also in in, Man in Manitoba, south about a hundred miles south of Winnipeg, um, there are such communities, and they 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 refuse to use cars, motor cars, and it's uh, but they become then isolated, um, quasi religious groups rather than a I, it's a concept of way of life, I guess, but. Uh, um, it's somehow, they seem isolated. They don't seem to be kind of, this, this is more, I guess somebody said a movement, and it's because there's an idea of how one should live that all of these places have, and I suppose that that's also true of them. I don't know, I don't know if anybody knows that, but I think it'd be very interesting to be able to compare those. You, well, you, know, you don't know these com communities in, in well, North America, do you? Mm -hmm. Do you know them? I, I know a little bit about them, yeah. but um, we, in our research, and that's which is still evolving, we, we look more at the Eastern European models, like the Kolchos and, and, and um, the PGLs in, in Poland. The, the, the wonderful thing in Kibbutzim is, A, that they were not as dogmatic as people would uh, think they were. And, and they were very liberal in many, in many things. And this is what, what um, really, um, 
facilitated their development. Otherwise, I don't think they would have survived their 100 years. Um, <coughs> and the other thing is uh, that's uh, definitely in, com in comparison with, uh, with the Eastern European models that it was not all top down. That the movement existed, but the movement was not, uh, the movement or the state did not dictate everything. There was a lot of grassroots um, uh, developments and grassroots uh, involvement in everything. The, the, it was a, it was a, basically it was a, just a direct uh, democracy. The, the members really decided about everything for the good and for the bad and, and, and many people, and that's part of why they, you can say they failed because it's it really, you can, it's really hard to live this way if you want to take a vacation, you need to ask your neighbors and, and everybody you, you, you fought with or you, you, you had a, a conflict with in the last 30 years and then you go and ask them for this or that. And, and this is what really, the, the strains in living in such a community is, are immense, but, but there was in, in, there were, they had all these kind of um, outlets for these stresses that, uh, that really um, made them possible to, to go on, I guess. Uh. Over here. Hmm? Over here. Over here. You're looking at the wrong place. Here. Hi. Hi. Uh, two brief questions. Can you describe a difference between Kibbutzim and Moshavim? Do Moshavim still exist? And what is the basic difference between the two? And my second question is, at the end you showed us a video, uh, one of the Kibbutzim were up for sale and you showed the decline and, and the degradation. And at the same time then you made a joke about a new house on the same spot called like Chateau Kibbutz. So what was happening in that particular kibbutz? The, the old buildings were just becoming to, left to degrade and new buildings were built up and, and the status was changing to more capitalist form of kibbutz. Uh, so, and is that the trend in a lot of kibbutzim? That was my second question. <coughs> we'll start with the Moshavim because the Moshavim, it, it's a whole new lecture. But the, the Moshav, were, there were two models of Moshav. There was the Moshav Shitufi, the collective Moshav, and the Moshav of Dim, the workers Moshav. But when the, in the collective one, the, the many of the different production um, resources were collective uh, and social life, social life was collective, but then every, every resident, every member of, of the collective had his own property. It was based on private property. You had your own house, you had your own agricultural field, and you could make a living out of it. The Moshav of Dim was just, it's a, it's a village. It's, a, it's a, basically, it's, a, it's all based on, on capitalist ideas of private property, et cetera. And the, the, now the, the Moshav Shitufi, the, they, are, they are going through the same, um, uh, the same processes as the Kibbutzim. Most of them are becoming Moshav of Dim, uh, workers uh, Moshav. Um, but uh, the, the kibbutzim still exist, and in, in Israel there are 285 kibbutzim. Around 70 of them are still classic kibbutzim. They're not. They're not all gone, and and they're still. They're still. Even though those who go when privatized, are still. They still consider them themselves kibbutzim. Only about five or six have stopped being kibbutzim. One of them is the one I showed here, and and it's a it's a really interesting story. This, it was the only. Uh, kibbutz associated with a with the Communist Party. This is why it was never a part of any uh, national movement of kibbutzim. Um, it went. Uh, it it was always very small um, and always very poor. It doesn't doesn't d never developed uh, industry or anything else. In the 1980s, it almost went bankrupt for the first time, and they, they absorbed um, undifferentiated. The, undifferentially absorbed everyone who wanted to, to come in. And, and, and that was the first wave of, of, of uh, their degra uh, degradation. <coughs> the, the people who went in were not uh, associated to the ideology at all. All they wanted is the lifestyle of this small uh, community. Um, they found themselves in, in a huge debt in, in the late uh, 80s and went broke. What happened is what, what brought to this situation, that's the interesting part. When the, uh, when the disengagement plan with the Gaza Strip um, occurred, they absorbed a community um, of, of refu uh, refugees or evacuees 
from uh, North Samaria. Uh, it's a, um, a settlement called Chomesh. They absorbed the whole settlement into, their, their, into them. And they, they, they created what was the kibbutz and this settlement, which was, uh, this was the first phase of the suburban uh, development of the kibbutz. Now, when they did that, the government erased their debt and um, if every settler from North Samaria got a uh, thousand square meters lot, every kibbutznik got the same size of lot, but they got two. So you got half of it within the kibbutz, the old kibbutz camp, and a new one in the suburb, the, the one that is adjacent to the kibbutz. What happened is that most of the kibbutznik just built their new houses in this new development and abandoned the old one. So the, 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 the suburb is thriving, the old kibbutz is dying out, and now it's a process they sell out the, the, the lot that they, um, that they abandoned. And so, so first they, they built the, the suburban ring, abandoned the, the, the inside, and now they're the, the new settlers, the, those who bought the old lots, start uh, developing the inside. So that, that's, the, that's the process that, uh, that you see here. Uh, there are a lot of questions, I don't know. Were there any examples of um, kibbutz that included both Jewish and Muslim Palestinians? And uh, was the kibbutz model ever offered as sort of an alternative for any kind of political reconciliation or as an example in that regard? It's, um, well, that's an interesting question. Actually, there was one kibbutz that um, I think it was in the, somewhere in the 50s, a kibbutz that was supposed to be Arab um, Jewish. Um, it didn't hold for, uh, for long because the, the government didn't support and didn't give it their resources. Today, there are Arabs living in kibbutzim. There are Arab members in kibbutzim, uh, but not as a general thing. Um, it's interesting what you're suggesting because uh, I actually brought once in, 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 in a general meeting talking about the Bedouins in the Negev, uh, which is another thing that I'm researching now. That's the next, uh, next thing. Um, I suggested that they will um, use the kibbutzim model for the Bedouins but it was, of course, rejected because nobody sees the kibbutzim as a, as a viable model for anything. I think we have time for two more questions. One here. Bonjour. En fait, la question sera en français. Première, dans les modèles que vous exposez, on ne voit pas de synagogue ou de lieu de culte. In the model you see a kibbutz that is not a synagogue. Uh, does that mean that the, the religious life is not important there? I, I would like to clarify those two the things. And the second question, if my English is good, is how is the life of the children? I was like surprised also to, s I was surprised to see that the children are all the time together. And then how is the evolution of the children? They s do they s do they still there when they go and they or they go out to the kibbutz? <coughs> well. The, the question of the synagogue. Actually, one of the four movements in the kibbutzim was the religious kibbutz. And there, the center, the social center, is the dining hall and the synagogue. The second is that there were synagogues in most kibbutzim. And uh, not because the kibbutzim were any, uh, religious, they rejected religion. But, especially in the united movement, the, the kibbutzim Uchad, the, which were more liberal, uh, they absorbed or they accepted uh, the, grand, the grandparents, what they call the grandparents. These are the, the parents of their members. And these were usually were more religious people, so they built synagogues for them, which was totally fine. Um, today you can find ki, uh, a synagogue in all, all the kibbutzim, uh, especially today with they, because they absorbed new populations and, and the ideology, the left-wing socialist ideology is not, is not that strong anymore. So they built um, synagogues in all the kibbutzim. Uh, the issue about the, the children, um, if I understood the question, the, the children where they got to the, to the age of 18 had the choice to leave or to uh, apply for membership. It was not um, automatic. You do not 
become a member of a kibbutz just because you were born there. You have to uh, prove yourself um, uh, as a productive member of society before you, you get accepted. Uh, it's interesting to see that uh, I was thinking about it, the, 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 the bomb shelter. Uh, today there are no ch children houses at all, not even in the collective kibbutz, in the classic kibbutz, and they don't have um, children houses anymore. And it happened, um, it, was a, it was a wave during the 80s, even from the 60s on, this idea of the children houses kind of uh, started to, uh, to vanish. But the moment that it happened is the, the first uh, Gulf War, that many of the kibbutzim still had this idea um, uh, intact. But in the Gulf War, the, the, the mothers did not, did not allow their children to live in the, in the children's houses anymore. They took, him, they took them to the, to the rooms. Um, and even in the kibbutzim that had no, the, the assembly did not decide to eliminate the children's houses, the mothers never allowed their children to go back to the, to the children's houses. And this is it. It was a kind of a, a mother, mother's decision that this is it. Enough is enough. I think there was only one kibbutz that kept on afterwards. Uh, kibbutz Baram, which was still very pragmatic, uh, uh, very dogmatic uh, kibbutz. But, and then in 95, I think, they, they accepted the, the decision to eliminate the, the children's society. I'm sorry, I think this will have to be the last question. <coughs> uh, how strong was the industrialization of some of the kibbutzim which resorted to that because of economic problems? And um, how viable are those particular kibbutzim today? And I want to congratulate you for the way you've covered a very diverse uh, subject, very important, not only to Israel, but uh, to the world. Well, thank you. <coughs> the, the issue of industrialization um, is an issue that was on the table ever since the En Charod Manifesto in 1924. Um, another part of the manifesto that I didn't quote today uh, talks about the Israel Valley as the, as the industrial um, center of Israel. Actually, there, there is a, when Ben-Gurion decided that, um, that Jerusalem would be the um, um, eternal capital of the Jewish people, uh, Israel Valley were very disappointed because they thought it, they, they, the Israel Valley should be the capital and Harod. Um, uh, industry is, is a very viable part of kibbutzim even today, but it, it, uh, it was always the case, especially in the big, in the large and growing kibbutzim. They, 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 it's, it was not only agriculture, it was, uh, the in industry was a, a very viable part of, of, of life. Today, as I, as I, as I mentioned, 12% uh, of the gross industrial product of Israel is, is, uh, is um, based uh, or originates from the kibbutzim. Um, and it's all international. There are international corporations held by kibbutzim. Um, for example, the, 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 um, the strongest uh, factory of a kibbutz, it's a very small kibbutz called Sasa. Um, and they're the most successful um, uh, factory in all the kibbutzim um, uh, region. Um, what they do, they, um, what do you call it? They, they, they have, they are contractors of the American, American army, uh, and they, they uh, develop all these methods of, of defending their soft vehicles. They're, they're like, they're, they're world leaders and, and they have three, mi three million, three hundred million dollars each year contracts with, with, with the, with the um, American um, military. And, and this supports a, a kibbutz of 200 members. It's still very, very classic. It's still very collective and they can support it, of course. Um, and there are others. And the, the, the gross product, the industrial product in kibbutzim is immense today, still. Thank you again for this amazing presentation on a very complex subject. Thank you so much. Thank you.